Okay, so uh, let's make a start. So uh, where have we got to? So we're on page 87 of chapter 2. And uh, we've been talking about this notion of random variables. So recall that a random variable is associated to a probability space. So you have the omega, your f, and your p. And to every omega, every possible outcome in our experiment space, we associate a numerical value. And that numerical value is called a random variable. Now, this random variable can take on countable or countably infinite potential values. That's a discrete random variable. Or it can take values over an interval or, a, or an unbounded interval, in which case it is continuous. And so if you recall some of the things that we've talked about today, uh, last week, just to remind you, were a couple of things. Let me just remind you very fast if I can find a slide of relevance. So the, the cumulative distribution function for a random variable x is just the probability that the random variable x is at most little x. So it's a function of little x, but the random variable is x. And that is associated to the probability mass function in this way if the random variable is discrete, i.e. we sum over all dummy values t which are at most x. Or if you're continuous, uh, where is it? It's the integral between the lower integral limit minus infinity, which could be much smaller than your lower limit of the random variable, up to the argument little x of the probability density function. So remember that this probability mass function represents the probability that a random variable x takes a value little t for any t in the, p p the space of possible values which the random variable could take. Um, but in the case of a probability density function, this thing here does not represent the probability that a random variable takes the value t because the, the because of the infinite nature of the state space uh, we the probability of any point is zero okay so this just represents the densities and probabilities in this case are computed by areas under this curve so this curve is a non-negative function which integrates to one again in the case of discrete random variables where am i going somewhere in the case of discrete random variables, this function f of t is non-negative, but it's at most 1 and sums to 1. Okay, so that's a different thing. Okay, so that's um, basically where we were at the end of Friday's lecture, and we'd looked at some um, methods of computing probabilities associated to that cumulative distribution function. What we're going to do in today's lecture, essentially, is to summarize this, or kind of finish off this uh, section or chapter when we discuss the notion of summarizing random variables. So random, a random variable is a quantity. We don't know what it is. We have some way of measuring the probabilities of the random variable being in sets via the PDF or the PMF, depending on the nature of the random variable. Um, but we also may be interested in summarizing the possible um, values or that the random variable may take. And the one way to proceed in this uh, fashion is to obtain estimates or compute estimates uh, to compute expectations of random variables. So let's move into this. So basically this is going to summarize a theoretical average of a random variable or a function of a random variable uh, as we will see later on. So the definition is like this. I have a random variable capital X. It's discrete. That is to say the possible values that it could take are countable, countably infinite or finite. Okay, and the probability mass function is f of x, so that's the probability that the random variable capital X takes the value little x. Now, the mean or the expected value of the random variable x is denoted by e of x, right? So this thing, well, I'll explain what it is in a moment. You can also use the notation mu of x. I prefer this one; it's more explicit. Is defined by so the expectation of x is equal to the sum over all possible values of x weighted by the probability that the random variable takes the value x. Okay, so let's think a little bit about what this means in the discrete case. Well, what it is is a kind of proxy for the average value that the random variable takes. So it's very reasonable to say I have a random variable uh, it could take value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, so on and so forth. What's the average value that that random variable may take? For example, if I wish to estimate that random variable. 
This is a definition of one way to do that is through the mean or the expectation. And what it does is for every position in the sample space here at xi, it weights it by the chance that it happens. So this is a weighted average. Okay. So basically, you, you just weight each possible value xi by how likely they are. And so one expects that in some sense, this quantity, expect, the expectation of x is somehow dominated by the values of x which are most likely. Now, there are a few remarks to be made. So there are a couple of things. For first of all, the quantity which you, we have defined on the bottom of the slide, the expectation of x is not a random quantity. Okay, it's a number. Okay, by the very nature uh, of its um, calculation, it's something which lies potentially on the range of the random variable. Of course, implicit in this definition is that the summation that I've written down at the bottom of the slide exists. Okay, and it's reasonable. It's actually not the case that every random variable has finite mean or finite expectation. But if it does exist, then it's basically a finite constant and not. And there's nothing random about it. The other thing to mention, as it says on this slide, is the expected value of x may not take a value which the random variable itself, itself attains. So, for example, if I compute the expectation of a random variable, which could be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, and I take the, the, I compute the expected value of that random variable, it could be that my expected value is 3.5, which is not a potential value you can take from the random variable. There's nothing that says that this constant that you compute lies in the range of the random variable. Okay, so that's the definition if the random variable is discrete. It's virtually the same definition if the random variable is continuous. So if x is a continuous random variable with probability density function f of x, again that represents not the probability that x is equal to x, then the expectation of x or the mean is the integral over the whole, whole space Okay, of x times f of x dx. Now, key, the key point here is, again, there is no reason that this integral exists in general. And again, there are random variables which are continuous for which this integral is infinite, and therefore that, those random variables have zero, do not have a mean, okay, or what we call a first moment. Okay, and as I said earlier, what this is, the interpretation in your mind is basically the average value of the random variable. Okay. Is not necessarily the most likely value of the random variable, especially in the discrete case. Let's make some remarks. So the expected value is, of course, as I said earlier, the, the sum and integrals, they have to exist. Otherwise, uh, there is no expectation. That's what the first remark says. If you take the discrete case and you take f of x being what we call the uniform distribution, that is to say that the each value of xi has equal probability and there are capital N possible values of the xi's, then the expectation of x is just what we know in um, standard statistics you may have learned back at, uh, well, you may have learned already, I would have thought, this the average value of the x's. That's the, that's the empirical mean, but in this case, because there are capital N values, uh, the empirical mean and the expectation coincide. Okay, so just in case you're wondering what is the link between the mean of data and the mean the mean we're talking about here, the, the expectation, there is a link, but only in the case where the uniform distribution is the probability mass function. And of course, the exercise is discrete. Okay, let's have a look at an example. So there are, this one's a pretty straightforward example. So you have a gambling game and an individual gains five if in three roll, uh, three flips of a fair cane, coin, the uh, flips all end up heads or tails. Okay, and if you get one or two heads, this person loses three. Okay, we don't know what five or three means, but they're units. And we're asked, what is the expected gain? How much money or not can this person make from playing this particular game? Okay, so now we define the random variable. X is the amount that this individual can gain in this game. Okay, so they can gain five, okay. That's what we said, if you get three heads or three tails. And otherwise, that individual can lose three in the case uh, otherwise. Okay, so this is not very well stated. What this really says is this individual pays out if you don't get three heads or three tails. That's really what it means. Otherwise, it's, it's very strangely stated. 
So the probability that you gain five is the probability you get three heads or three tails. So the probability of getting three heads of a fair coin is one over eight. The probability of getting three tails in three flips is one over eight. Those are mutually exclusive events. So the probability of the union is equal to the sum of the probabilities. So that's probability is one over four. In the case where they do, this individual doesn't get one of these two cases, then that individual loses three. So the probability that this individual loses three is basically one minus one over four is three over four. Okay, now the expected gain by definition is the expected value of x is the, the value of x weighted by its probability. So with probability one over four, that individual gains five plus with probability 3 over 4, that individual loses 3. So if you add these things together, you get back minus 1. So this individual, this game is kind of a bit silly for this person to play because that individual will lose, excuse me, will lose 1 per, not per toss, but per game. Okay, this is not a very good statement. This is per game, not per toss. Okay. So that's example 1. Example 2. Now, suppose this, is, this game consists of rolling a fair die, balanced die, okay, six-sided dice, and you've got to play C to play the game, and if you get I, then you get I back, okay? So the question is, uh, how much should we play the game, how much would we pay if the game is fair? That is to say that the expected gain in this game is zero. Of course, what this means on average, I don't win anything, but, you know, of course, you might win sometimes, you might lose sometimes. So we want to work out what is um, the, the uh, amount that we should pay C. Okay, so now let's X denote the outcome of the roll of the die. Okay, so then the probability that X is equal to 1 is equal to 2 is equal to 3 is equal to 4 is equal to 5 over 6 is equal likely, so it's a fair die. So we have 1 over 6, we knew that from the beginning. Now, the expected score of the die is, of course, the sum of these times. This is 1 times a sixth plus 2 times a sixth plus 3 times a sixth plus dot 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 plus 6 times 1 over 6, which is the same as this arithmetic, arithmetic sum times 1 over 6. So that's 3.5. You can check that. That's pretty straightforward. Now, the question is, if you want to play a fair game, the expected amount you pay is the ex should be the expected amount you get. Now the expected amount you get is 3.5, so the expected amount, so the, maxed, so the the amount that you should pay should be 3.5. Okay, then on average you gain nothing. Okay. An alternate solution. Well, there is another way of doing this. It's exactly the same solution, by the way. It's it's not a different uh, answer. It's the same answer. So another way of doing that, you define a random variable y, which is the amount that you gain when you roll the die. Okay, so how much do you gain? If you, if you roll i, you gain i minus c. Okay, so there's a possible losses there depending on what c is. Okay, now the probability that you get y is 1 minus c is the same as the probability you get 2 minus c is dot dot dot, is the same as the probability that y is equal to 6 minus c, which is a sixth. So the expected value of y is 1 minus c plus 2 minus c plus dot 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 plus 6 minus c. All, each one is multiplied by a sixth, and that equals to 3.5 minus c, okay, because you get this thing up here six times and you divide by 1 over 6, okay. And so for the fair game to be fair, you need the expectation of y to equal 0. So that means that c again must be 3.5. I have to solve the equation 3.5 minus c is equal to 0. Of course, both solutions that we've put here are identical because it's the same, it's the same question. Okay, now this is uh, another question. So again, these are just kind of um, computing expectations. So you have a pilot and they want to ensure, I don't know if you can ensure an, ensure an airline, but he wants to ensure something associated to his airline for a million, I don't know a million what, but let's say it's a million dollars. Uh, the insurance company uh, works out, they think that the chance that that individual will have a total loss, that is, that basically whatever is insuring will become completely useless with this probability, which is exceptionally small. You might lose 50% with this probability, 25% with this, and 10% with this probability. Okay, so if you 
Uh, otherwise, basically the thing that is insuring doesn't lose value. It's a kind of funny question, but I suppose it's more insuring a single flight rather than anything else. Okay, so now ignoring other, all other partial losses, so basically what he's, say, what he's saying is the insurance company thinks you can only, it, only, it can be a wipeout, for example, the plane crashes, or uh, it crashes but it doesn't get destroyed or something like that with these chances, and otherwise everything goes fine and there's no loss of value. The question is, what premium should the insurance company charge so that they make sure that on average they make a profit of 5,000? Okay, so let's have a look. The solution is quite nice. So the expected loss is what? Well, with probability 0 0.0002, the loss is everything. Okay, with probability 0 0.001, you lose 50%. With probability 0 0.01, you lose this, 0 0.01, you lose this, and so on and so forth. And otherwise, you don't lose anything. Okay, so basically, on the, let's say we, this individual flies the plane, so that basically on average they expect to lose 4,200 from this flight, okay, in the sense that the flight could crash or there is some other more minor damage. Now, basically now the insurance company wants to make 5,000, okay, so if they charge 9,200, their expected loss, their expected gain, if you like, is 9,200 minus 4,200 is exactly 5,000. Okay, so basically the premium should be 9,200. So it's basically the cost of the premium, take away the expected losses, the expected amount of money they make. We want that to be 5,000, so we solve to get 9,200. Okay, so those two, all those three examples were the scenario where the random variable x was discrete and in fact on a countable space. In this case, we're given a PDF of a random variable uh, for uh, gravel sales, which looks like this. Okay, so this is PDF is three over two one minus x squared of x is in the interval zero one and zero otherwise, and we're asked to compute the expectation. So here, there's nothing too more complicated than computing the integral of x times this function over zero one. Okay, so by definition, the expectation is x times f of x. Uh, and so this thing is only equal to the integral to 0 to 1 because remember this density function is 0 out of the, outside the interval 0, 1. x, and this is the PDF, 3 over 2, 1 minus x squared. Okay, and now we're doing simple integration. Okay, so we can take the factor 3 over 2 outside the integral. That's what it does here. You multiply x times this, you get x minus x cubed. Okay, and now integration, the integration task is simple. I have 3 over 2, I integrate x, I get x squared over 2. I integrate x cubed, I get x to the 4 over 4, and I go between the interval 0 to 1. So clearly when x is equal to 0, this is 0, so I just have to substitute 1 into here, and I get a half minus a quarter times 3 over 2, which is 3 over 8. <coughs> okay, so in the case of this continuous example, it's fairly straightforward to compute the associated expectation. Okay, so example five is more of the same, really. Uh, you're given the PDF of a continuous random variable which denotes the total number of hours in units per hundred hours that a family runs a vacuum cleaner over a period of one year. Okay, so this density function is linear between x is between 0 to 1, is 2 minus x otherwise and 0, uh, sorry, if x is between 1 and 2, it's 2 minus x and 0 otherwise. Okay, and if you want, you can check that the integral under that curve that we've defined there is precisely 1, and moreover, it's obviously a non-negative function uh, as specified. Okay, and then the question asks, find the average number of hours per year that families run their vacuum cleaners. Okay, so nothing more than computing the expectation of x and multiplying through by 100. Okay, so the expectation of x Again, is by definition the integral between minus infinity and infinity of x times f of x. Okay, so this thing is only non-zero in the interval 0 to 1, in which case it takes the value of x, so I get x squared here, or when it, it goes between 1 and 2 and I get 2 minus x, and I multiply by x here. Okay, and so now I'm just computing these st straightforward integrals. So of course the integral of x to the uh, the integral the uh, indefinite integral of x squared is x to the three over three, and I go between zero and one. The integral of this is of course x squared minus x cubed over three. Okay, 
This one, I put ones, I get one over three, the zero doesn't matter, and here I just have to put two and I subtract the case when I get one. Okay, that's what it does, does there. And so basically, if you do all those simple calculations at the end, the expectation of this random variable is one, but remember one unit is 100 hours, so the answer is that the individuals here, families, run their vacuum cleaner on average 100 hours per year, on average. Okay, so that was the definition of an expectation of a random variable, but one can go slightly further than this. Sometimes we're not interested just in the random variable, but we're also interested in a function of the random variable. So we take g, it's a function of the random variable, so this takes a point in the sample space of the range of the random variable to the real line. So this function is still real valued, okay? So that is to say it's a number. Okay, you give me an x, I give you, you put it inside g and it gives you a new number which is typically different than uh, x, but it is still real valued, okay? And I will explain in a moment scenario where you want to do this, okay? There are actually easy examples, but we will build this up more slowly, first of all, from the examples. Okay, so now if I want to compute the expectation of G, assuming it exists, right, so the, the expectation of G of X is defined to be the sum over all possible values of X of the function of the random variable multiplied by the probability mass function for a discrete random variable, again, providing the sum exists. And again, in the case of continuous random variables, the expectation of g of x, well, I'm just replacing summation with integration. There's nothing more than that. And again, this thing is only defined if the integral exists. The integrand has to basically decay uh, towards zero fast enough in order, in order for this integral to be well defined. Okay, so why are we interested in this? Well, there are some special cases. So the first one is the case of something called the variance of a random variable. So the variance of the random variable can be computed by computing, by calculating the expectation of this thing. Okay. Now why is that interesting? Well, what the variance represents very roughly is the spread of a random variable, especially around its mean. So that is to say, random variables, suppose you have two random variables on the same scale, they have the same mean but one has a significantly larger variance than the other, then that latter random variable is more spread out and you have less confidence about the value of the mean as a specification or estimate of that random variable. Okay, that's what it means. So again, what it means is the spread of the random variable and specifically around its mean. Okay, uh, and that of course is uh, under the proviso that the mean is a good summary for the random variable itself, which it may not be. Okay, so again, just think spread. Okay, if the, if there's one thing to be taken from what I said, this, it's just the spread of the random variable. And if, it, it, it's important to, to note so people sometimes make this mistake, the variance is not an absolute quantity. If I have a random variable on the set 1 to 100 and I have a variance of 10 and I have a random variable on the set 1 to a million and I have a variance 10, those variances are not comparable because the scale of those random variables are different. I cannot compare variances for random variables on different scales. Okay, It only makes sense if the scale of the random variable is the same. It is not a unitless quantity. Okay, So it's very important to interpret this you cannot say that one random variable is small, more spread out than the other if the scalings are completely different. Okay, so the definition of a variance, I'll tell you what it is before defining it, but let's have a look at it. So we define, we take a random variable x with a probability density function or probability mass function f, then the variance is defined to be the expectation of that function g, which is x minus mu x squared. So x scalar, mu x is scalar, that's the expectation, I square it, scalar. So I'm taking the expectation of a scalar or a real number. And if it's discrete, that's just the sum over all possible values of the functional. Or if it's, in, if it's a continuous, again, it's an integral over the range of this functional with respect to this PDF. Again, under the proviso that this functional has a finite integral with respect to the uh, density function or a finite sum when multiplying by the mass function, okay? And like I say, there's no guarantee that any random variable has such, such a uh, finite value, okay? You have a square here, so the class 
of random variables for which this thing is finite is actually smaller generally than the class of random variables which have finite expectation. Okay, just by notion that you're you're basically making the thing bigger if you have a value range of values outside plus minus one. Okay, so let's make some remarks. First of all, the variance of x is non-negative. Okay, why is that? I can tell you that immediately. Okay, you can see it from this thing. Okay, the reason is so it's easiest to see in the in the finite case, right? Each of these numbers here I'm squaring, right? So x minus mu x squared is always at, at most, sorry, at least zero. And then this thing is always non-zero. So what I'm doing is I'm adding together things which are non-negative. Okay, so at least this thing is non-negative. It's similarly true for the integral because the integrand is non-negative. So it, there exists a result that if I have an integrand and I'm integrating a function which is non-negative, then its integral is non-negative. Okay, that's really the reason why the variance is non-negative. So you never get a negative variance. So if you ever compute a variance in a question or an exam or something, you get a negative number, you've got an answer wrong because it, you cannot have a zero non-negative variance. You cannot have a negative variance by definition. It follows principally from the properties of integration and summation. Okay, it's nothing to do with probability at all. Uh, you can also show, we're going to prove this result later on, that you can decompose the variance of x into two quantities, the expectation of the square of a random variable minus the expectation of the random variable all squared. This quantity here and this quantity on the, the thing I'm highlighting here are not equal. This one I compute my expectation of x and I square it. In this one, I square the random variable and I then take the expectation. And it so happens that this thing here is at least as big as this thing here, which is why another reason why the variance is positive. Okay, there's a there's an inequality for that, although not that it's important here. Okay, so that's the 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 some some remarks on the variance. The key point again. So you probably were one of the first things you learned in statistics, I think, when you did this, was the notion of a standard deviation. A standard deviation is the square root of the variance. Okay, and it's the standard amount that e that uh, va variables or values deviate around the mean. It's kind of strange to use deviate, deviation and deviate in a de definition, but that's what it means. Okay, so it's all about the mean in this. It's a, it's a measure of centrality and spread around the mean. That's key, right? That's what standard deviation is all about. And as I said earlier, whether the expectation of a random variable is, a, is the sensible measure for uh, or estimate of a random variable remains to be seen depending on, on the nature of the PDF or PMF. Uh, and, and that's not important to understand at this stage, it's just my own remark. Okay, another special case is if you take the function g of x is equal x to the power k. Okay, so remember that we're using the lower case here, so it, I didn't say it, but basically when you, could, when you write down expectations, the, the random variable is always given an uppercase. This is a lower case because there's nothing to do with random variables, this is just a function. Okay, so keep it in mind, I should have said that right at the beginning of the lecture, that the random variable in these functions are always given uppercase. Okay, it's a, it's a con notational convention. Anyway, so the expectation of this functional g of x equals x to the power k is x to the power k, and it's called the kth moment of x. So the first moment is the expected value of x. The second moment, well, that is telling you something about the variance. The third moment, expected value of x to the power of 3, tells you something about the skewness. The fourth moment tells you about the kurtosis, and then nobody, can, one really cares after four moments. It's getting too many. Okay. Um, don't worry if you don't know what skewness and kurtosis are. I mean, if we ever, if we ever encounter them, I'll tell you, but at the moment we, you don't need to know about them. We'll just consider basically the case k is equal 1 or 2 because actually the computation of this function when you get below above k is 2 is rather tedious, especially if you're doing integration, if it's even attractable or if the integral exists at all. Okay, so let's look at an example. So these examples are going to, to uh, look at the, the notion of computing the expectations of random variables and functions of random variables and variances. Okay, so we're given a probability mass function. So in the notation of these notes, there's no D, there's PF, okay, probability function. 
So this is the random variable x can take the value minus 1, 0, 1, 2, and the random variable takes minus 1 with probability 1 upon 8, it takes the value 1 with probability 1 upon 8, and so on. Okay, we're asked two questions to compute the expectation of x, the variance of x, and then we want to compute uh, the expectation of this random variable y. We'll come back to that in a moment. So the expectation of x is tedious and straightforward. I take the value x, I multiply by m of x, and I multiply, I sum over all possible values of x. So that's simply minus 1 times 1 8 plus 0, I don't care about this one, it's going to be 0, plus 1 times 1 over 8 plus 2 times 4 over 8. Okay, that's what the formula you have written on here. And if you do all that simple calculation, you get back 1. And that's the expected value of this random variable. Now, to compute the variance, okay, so we can use our two formula. We're going to use the first one, which is the definition. So the variance of x, by definition, is the expectation of x minus the mean, which is 1 squared, weighted with respect to its probability mass function. So that's basically in the notation we established before, mu of x is equal to 1, so we put 1 here. That's by definition. So this variance is equal to this by definition. Okay, and then it's simple, right? So the first one, I take x is minus 1, so minus 1 minus 1 squared. The probability that we get my, uh, minus 1 is an eighth, plus I get 0 minus 1 squared times the probability to get 0 is 2 eighths. And for example, this one is I get 2, I get 2 with probability 4 over 8. Okay, so I add all these numbers together and I get 5 over 4, and that's the variance of this random variable. Okay. Alternatively, you could have used the other formula. Uh, in this case, they're both as tedious as each other, so it really doesn't matter which one you do. In this case, you can see what you do is you, we know that alternatively, although we have not established this formula, we will later on today, that the variance of x is the expected value of the square of the random variable minus the expectation of the random variable all squared. Okay, so this one we already know because this is 1 squared. Okay, so I just have to compute this one. So the expected value of x squared is x squared times f of x, sum over all possible values of x. Okay, so if I get x is equal to minus 1, I get minus 1 squared. The chance that happens is 1 over 8. If x is 0, I don't care. If x is 1, I get 1 with probability 1 over 8. If x is uh, 2, I get 2 squared times 4 over 8. You add those numbers together and you get 9 over 4. So the variance is 9 over 4 minus 1 squared, which is 5 over 4. Exactly the same question as you, same as the solution you got in the previous uh, part. Okay, so that's, uh, does it verifies the formula which we've claimed uh, in this particular scenario. Is of course not a proof that this formula holds in general. Okay, let's go back. So now remember in part B, we define the random variable x squared plus 2, and I want to compute the expectation of y and the variance of y. Okay, well this is again not so difficult. The expected value of y, by definition, is the expected value of x squared plus 2. So that's equal to x squared plus 2, the function of interest, weighted by the probability mass function. Okay, so x, square, x is equal to minus 1 with probability an eighth. So I get minus 1 squared plus 2 times an eighth is equal to 0 with probability 2 over 8. So I get 0 squared plus 2 times 2 over 8. This time I care if it's 0 because I've got this additive factor here. Uh, if x is 1 with probability 1 over 8, so I get 1 squared plus 2 times 1 over 8, and similarly here. So the answer is 17 over 4. Okay. If you want, although we have not shown this, okay, so this is skipping ahead, we are going to establish this property that it so happens that the expectation of y is the expectation of x squared plus 2. The expectation of x squared, we computed it, was 9 over 4. So the answer is 9 over 4 plus 2. This is much faster because we had already done the work, but we have not established this identity, okay, which we will do later on. The variance of y is now going to become, again, it's very simple, right? The variance of y is the expected value of, of um, the random variable minus its mean all squared. So the random variable is x squared plus 2. The mean is 17 over 4, apparently. Yes, 17 over 4. Um, and then we multiply by the probability mass function. So to compute this quantity, we have that x is equal to minus 1. So minus 1 plus 2 happens to, uh, minus 1 squared plus 2 happens to be 3, minus 17 over 4 squared. That happens with probability 1 over 8. And for example, this one 
is going to be 2 squared plus 2, so 4 plus 2 is 6, minus 17 over 4 all squared, multiply by the probability that the random variable takes the value 2, which is 4 over 8. So I add these numbers together and I get 51 over 16, which is the variance of y. Okay, and uh, sorry, okay, so one more time. We can also compute the value of y, compute the expected value of y squared first and then obtain the variance of y using this formula. Okay, so I can compute the expected value of y squared and the expected value of y, I've got it, and I can square that. So the expected value of y squared, so y takes the value 3 with probability 1 over 8 because y squared, don't forget it, is x squared plus 2. So if x, square, x is equal to minus 1, minus 1 plus minus 1 squared plus 2 is equal to 3, and 3 squared is what the value I get there. If x is equal to 1, then I get um, 2 plus 1 squared, sorry, 0. x is equal to 0. 0 plus 2 is 2. 2 squared times the probability that you get x is 0 is 2 over 8. And for example, here I've got 2 plus uh, the square of 2 is 4, so I get 6, 6 squared times 4 over 8, the chance I get x is equal to 2. So that's the expected value of x squared, uh, y squared. The variance of y is then this number, 178, minus the square of the expectation that I got at the start of the question, is also, again, 51 over 16. Okay, example 2. So example 2 is the case where you have continuous random variables. So in this case, you have a random variable x. It happens to be continuous, and it has a PDF, which you, it's written down there. So if x lies in the interval 0 to 15, it's x over 225. If x lies between 15 and 30, it's 30 minus x over 225, and it's 0 otherwise. So this function is at least non-negative, and if you compute the integral over the space, uh, you'll get back 1. Okay, so it's a valid PDF. Okay, we're going to do integrals with respect to this thing in a moment. Uh, so if you're worried about how to do that, it should be clear at the end of this question. So we want to compute the expectation and the variance, and um, this is a kind of straightforward task. So the expectation of x is x times the PDF. So the PDF is x over 225 between 0 and 15. It's 30 minus x over 225 between 15 and 30 times x, and it's 0 otherwise, so I don't care about anything else. Okay, and now I'm just computing these, these two integrals are fairly straightforward. So the factor 1 over 225 comes out of both of them. Okay, the integral of x squared is x to the 3 over 3 between 0 and 15. The integral of 30x minus x squared is 15x squared minus x to the 3 over 3 between 15 and 30. So this one is straightforward. I've got, got 15 to the power 3 over 3. In this one, I evaluate, first of all, this function at 30. That's what you're doing there. And you subtract the valuation of this function at 15. So I get minus this one. OK. And you sum all, put all those numbers into this equation, and you get back the number 15 for the expectation of x. OK, the variance of x. Well, it's easier to compute the expectation of x squared here than it is to compute the expected value of x minus um, the constant, which was whatever it was. It was uh, 15 all squared. Okay, It's easier to do that here. So the expected value of x squared is x squared times the PDF between 0 and 15 plus x squared times the PDF between 15 and 30 plus nothing because you get nothing here. Okay, and then we're doing the same task, essentially. We take the factor 1 over 225 out of both of these integrals, and then I integrate x to the 3. x to the 3, the integral of x to the 3 is x to the 4 over 4. I go between 0 and 15. And then I'm integrating 30x squared minus x to the 4, um, x to the 3, excuse me. So the integral of 30x squared is 10x to the power 3, and the integral of x to the 3 is x to the 4 over 4. And then if I plug in these numbers into these integrals, integrands, or the, the, the indefinite integrals, I get back 262.5. The variance then happens to be 262.5 minus a square of the mean. That variance, that's, the mean was 15, so 15 squared is 225, so I get 37.5 as the variance. Okay, good. All right, so let's have a look. So we've got any, any more examples. Okay, just one more example. So our third example, so again, this is just, again, something very similar. So we have a random variable x. It's the amount of time for which a book on a 
two-hour reserve at the science library is checked out by a randomly selected student and suppose that the random variable x has this PDF. Okay, so you can see that the integral is the, in, the, the density function against a non-negative function. If you integrate between 0 and 2 of the function, you'll get back 1. So we're asked this following. Compute the expectation of x, compute the variance of x, and the standard deviation. Well, once you have the variance, the standard deviation is simple. Sigma x is defined to be the square root of the variance of x, by the way. If the borrower is charged an amount h of x equals x squared when checkout duration x is, com is x, when the checkout duration is x, compute the, the expected charge. Okay, so we'll worry about c later because I've already forgotten what it was. Let's compute the expectation of x. So the expectation of x is simple. It's x multiplied by the PDF integrated over the range. The range is 0 and 2 here. So I'm integrating x squared over 2. And so if I want to integrate x squared over 2, that's x to the 3 over 6. OK, so I differentiate there. I get 3x squared over 6 is x squared over 2. OK, I go between 0 and 2. So 0 I don't care about. And I put in 2. 2 to the power of 3 is 8. 8 over 6 is 4 over 3. So that's the expectation of x. Now we want to compute the variance of x. And the standard deviation is simple after that. So the variance of x, so the easiest thing is to use the expectation of x squared uh, first. So that's x squared times the PDF integrated between 0 and 2. That's the range of support of the random variable. So now what I want to do is I want to integrate x to the 3 over 2. So that's integral is x to the, f is x to the 4 over 8. So if I integrate, differentiate that, I'll get 4x to the 3 over 8, which is x to the 3 over 2. OK, and I go between 0 and 2. I plug in these numbers. And I get back uh, 2. OK, 2 to the 4 over 8 is actually equal to 2. 2 to, to, to the 4 over 2 to the 3 is equal to 2. So the variance of this random variable is 2 minus the square of the mean. The mean was 4 over 3. So it's 2 minus 4 over 3 all squared is 2 over 9. So again, that, that's positive. And the variance, that's the variance. The standard deviation is the square root of this. So the square root of 2 over 9. OK, root 2 over 3, if you like. OK, part C. So basically, I want to compute the expected value of x squared. That's what it says. I mean, if you just cut through all of this nonsense, this is what you want to compute. It tells you right there. So the expected value of h of x and the expected value of x squared, well, we've done it. That's 2. So we save ourselves some calculation. And that is the solution. OK, so let's have a look at some properties of expectation. We'll just look at property one. I think we have the proof of it here. And then uh, we will have our break. <clears throat> so what this says is, if I take a linear combination of, uh, sorry, if I take a, a linear transformation of a random variable, that is to say, I take a and b, they're two real numbers, finite constants, and I want to compute the expectation of ax plus b, that's the same as a times the expected value of x plus b. That is, the constant it multiplies the expectation, and I add on the constant. Okay, and basically the proof of these results are nothing more than byproducts of standard properties of integrals and sums. Okay, our proofs are proof of this result is in the case where we're using summation. The proof with the integration or the continuous case is identical because basically integration and summations are linear operators. Okay, if you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm just going to sh I'm just trying to give you the intuition of why this is true. Uh, we're going to verify it now. So we take the discrete case. The continuous case is no different. Almost, you just you can literally just submit sub substitute the summations with integrals. So the expectation of a x plus b is by definition a times x plus b times the probability mass function. Okay. So what do we know? We know that the sum of a two sums is the sum of the sums. Now this is what this says. Basically, I have this thing multiplied by f of x plus this thing times f of x, and I'm summing those two things. Okay, so that's the same as the sum of these two things. S summation is a linear operator. Okay, we're almost finished now. Well, a is a constant, I can take it outside. B is a constant, I can take it outside, and I'm left with A times the sum over all x's of x times f of x, plus B times the sum over all x's of f of x. Okay, well this one by definition is the expectation of the x. f of x is a PDF, PMF, excuse me, so it sums to 1. 
okay? So this thing, this quantity on your left-hand side is equal to A times the expectation of X plus B, which is exactly the thing that we wanted to verify. And like I say, it's true also in the, in the continuous case. You can put integrals here, you're going to get the same thing. Okay, let's have a look at, okay, so we're just going to finish with this slide before we have a break. So there are two special cases. So if we allow the constant b to equal zero, what it means is the expectation of any linear perturbation of x, i.e. multiply a times x, is the same times a times the expectation of x. That should have been clear from the calculations we've been doing already, actually. If a is equal to 1, well, this is not surprising, then you get the expectation of x plus b is expectation of x plus b. The expectation of a constant is the constant itself. Okay, that's basically what we are saying there. And in general, what that means, in fact, is true in general. So if I take any linear combination of nonlinear functions of x, then the expectation of that linear combination of those nonlinear functions of x is precisely a linear combination of those expectations. That's true for any k for which this expectation makes sense, actually. So k could potentially be infinite, by the way. These a k are constants. OK. Any, any functions. So of course, the proviso of these properties that we're writing down is that the expectations themselves exist from the beginning, because if they did not, then these are tr statements which don't, are kind of trivial. right? Infinity equals infinity. It's kind of a silly thing to write down. Okay, so uh, let's have a break for five minutes. So we'll resume at 14.51 and uh, we'll look at more properties of expectations. Okay, so let's uh, resume to this uh, second and last section of uh, today's lecture. So uh, let's have a look at a property two, which is the variance of a random variable. So the randoms of the, va random, the variance of a random variable V of X happens to be equal to the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x all squared. Okay, so we used this without uh, proof beforehand, and we can prove that in general. And you can prove that now basically using property one. It's fairly straightforward. So let's start with the definition. The definition of the variance of x is the expectation of a random variable minus its mean all squared. Okay, so now I multiply out the back brackets, excuse me, so the, the x minus mu of x all squared is x squared minus 2 times x times mu of x plus mu of x all squared. Okay, that's just squaring out those brackets, nothing more complicated than that. Now what we're going to do is the fact that the expectation of a function of random linear combination of random variables is equal to the sum of those things. So this expectation of this is the expectation of x squared minus the expectation of 2 times x times mu of x plus the expectation of mu of x squared. Okay. Right. Okay. So now to what will we do? Well, this term here is never going to change. We can't do anything with it. Okay. So that's going to stay the same all the way. This one, well, 2 times mu of x is a constant. So I can take it outside my expectation. So I get 2 times mu of x times the expectation of x. Nothing more than that. Now, mu of x squared is a constant, so the expectation of a constant is equal to the constant itself. Okay, and now we're almost done, because we know by definition that the expectation of x is equal to mu of x. So what this reads as is the expectation of x squared minus 2 times mu of x squared plus mu of x squared. Okay, so this one and this one simplify a little to give us the expected value of x squared minus mu of x all squared. Okay, and here we did not make any assumption about the random variable being continuous or discrete because basically these properties hold whether or not you're discrete or continuous. Okay, so another property which is uh, useful to know is the variance of a linear combination AX plus a constant B of a random variable is the square of the constant times the variance of X. Okay, the key point to remember here is that the variance of a constant is zero because the expectation of uh, a constant is its constant, and then the variation around that constant value is constant, which is zero. You don't vary around a constant. So the variation of a constant is zero, and so that's why you get this thing, okay? And basically, like I said, if you like, it's just a structural property of uh, sums and integrals. Let's establish that. So the variance of AX plus B 
is equal to, as we established in our previous calculation, the expectation of the square of the random variable, take away the expectation of that random variable, all squared. Okay, so now if I multiply out these brackets, I get a squared times x squared plus 2 times ax times b plus b squared. Okay, and this one, well, we know that the expectation of ax plus b is a times mu of x plus b, all squared. Okay, the square is there. That one comes from the very first property that we derived beforehand. Okay, so now what we're going to do is to just now basically play around with this. So now, expected value of a squared times x squared is equal to, so the expectation of this linear combination is the sum of the expectations. So I get a expected value of a squared x squared, which is a squared, the expected value of x squared. I get 2ab times the expected value of x. The expected value of this constant is the constant itself. Okay, so this line here follows precisely from this upper line here. This one I just multiply out the brackets. So I get a squared mu x squared plus 2ab mu x plus b squared. Okay, so we're almost there. Okay, because you can see instantly these b squared will cancel. This one is 2ab times mu of x. I have 2ab times mu of x. I have a minus here, so this one and this one cancels. So I'm left with a squared, the expectation of x squared, minus a squared times mu of x squared. Okay, so I can take out the factor a squared. I get the a squared times the expected value of x squared minus mu x squared, and that thing is the variance. Okay, so I get a squared times the variance. So basically the constant doesn't play in it's any make any difference to the variance of this linear combination. Okay, example four, I'm not sure that the, I don't remember what example one was anymore, but anyway, let's have a look at it. So you have a jewelry shop and they purchase three necklaces of a certain type and it's $500 a piece. They're gonna sell them for $1,000 a piece and the designer will buy back anything which is unsold at $200 per piece. Now let's denote x the number of necklaces sold and we suppose that x has this following probability distribution. So I sell none with probability point 0.1, 1 with probability point 0.2, 2 with probability point 0.3 and 3 with probability point 0.4 and then they sum those things together and I get back 1. We were asked to find the expected gain from this jewelry shop and the variance of that gain. Okay. So now we define g of x as to be equal to the revenue minus the cost. So the money that they make, right, is going to be this. Okay, why is that the case, right? So basically, if they sell x, they get a thousand. Okay, but we don't know if x is zero, one, two, th or three. Now, if they don't sell, they what they're going to do is they're going to get two hundred dollars back for every one they don't sell. So that's three hundred minus three minus x. And the whole thing has cost them three times 500 because they bought $1,500 worth of uh, these bracelets or whatever, the necklaces. So the, uh, the gain that they have, okay, so that's 1,000x minus uh, 200x, so that's 800x, and I get minus six, uh, sorry, I get 600 plus 1,500, minus 1,500, sorry, is equal to 900. So that's their gain. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to compute the expectation of this random variable and the variance of it. So the expected gain is going to be when I take x is 0, okay, I multiply it by that by the probability I get 0, and I take x is 1, this is the function g, and the probability I get 1, g is 2, probability I get 2, and g is 3, with the probability I get 3. So the total expectation of this function is just going to be, so when 0 I get minus 900, probability point 0.1, and then by 3 I get 1,500 with probability point 0.4. So the expected gain is $700. So I'm going to make $700 on average. But it's important to understand how variable that value is. So now to compute the variance of this, I'm going to compute the second moment of g, and I'm going to subtract the expectation of g all square, and that's going to give me the variance of my gain. So the expected value of g squared, so I know that when it's 0, I get minus 900, so I get that squared times 0.1. I know when it's uh, x is 1, I get minus 100, I square that, and I get 0.2. When it's uh, 2, I get uh, 700 squared, and I get 3 is 1500 squared times 0.4. So that's 1.13 million. 1.13 million. Uh, that's, the vari that's the second moment. The variance is then that number, Multi minus the expectation all squared 
is 64, 640,000, excuse me. And the standard deviation is the uh, square root of that, although I don't think we're asked for that. The variance of the game. Okay, so basically, if you wanted to understand the kind of profitability of this type of endeavor, well, you might expect to make 700 plus or minus 800. So there's a chance with a there's a reasonable, if you, if you, I suppose that one standard deviation is a reasonable measure of the plus or minus that I might make, then I probably would expect to get 700 plus or minus 800. So on average I might make, there's a chance I could make 1500, but I could also lose uh, $100 as well uh, based upon that kind of interval of values. Example five. So this goes back to a probability, uh, probability density function we've seen already. So we're told that the probability density function, or the distribution of the amount of gravel in tons sold by a particular construction supply company in a given week has a continuous random variable, and this is this PDF. And we're asked to compute the mean and the variance, and I think we've pretty much have done that already. The expected value of x, okay, is x times the density function integrated over all possible values. That's x times the density function, which is only defined on 0, 1, and 0, otherwise I don't care. So then I'm just computing this integral. I can take 3 over 2 outside the integral, and I'm in integrating x squared minus x to the 3, and that indefinite integral is x squared over 2 minus x to the 4 over 4. If I put 1 in here, I'll get uh, 1 over 4 times 3 over 2, and 0 doesn't matter. So 3 over 8 is the expectation. We have already seen that calculation today, so uh, hopefully there was no shock there. The variance, I compute the second moment. The second moment is the expected value of x squared times the PDF. Okay, so that's x squared times the PDF over 0 to 1. Okay, and then we're playing almost the same game. We take 3 over 2 outside, and I'm integrating x cubed minus x to the 4, which is uh, x cubed, x, sorry, x squared minus x cubed, sorry. So that's x to the 3 minus x to the 4, x to the 5 over 5. At 0, I'm going to get 0, and 1, I'm going to get a third minus a fifth, which is 2 fifteenths times 3 over 2 is 1 over 5. Okay, so the variance is 1 over 5 minus the mean all squared is 19 over 320, apparently. And that's it. Okay, let's have a look at another example. So example number 6, which is for uh, a hosp the hospital period in days, for patients following treatment for a certain type of kidney disorder is a random variable which is x plus 4. Okay, so they must spend at least four days uh, in, in uh, the hospital. And x is a random variable which looks like this. Okay, the x plus 4 is strategic, it's going to make life very easy. X is a positive random variable. So you could feasibly, this density function says with a kind of hyperbolic rate that basically the probability density is getting small very fast, but you could have a very long time in hospital, especially in reality on four. So now that asks you to find the average number of days that a person is hospitalized following the treatment for this disorder, which is very straightforward. I want to compute the expected value of X plus four. That's it. Okay, so the expected value of x plus 4 is x plus 4 times the PDF of x integrated over the road domain. So the, the, the domain is x is positive. Okay, so x plus 4 times x plus 4 to the power of 3 divided by that, sorry, is 32 over x plus 4 squared. And now we're in a fairly straightforward situation because integrating this one straightforward, it's minus 32 over x plus 4 to, to, divided by that. Okay, so if you differentiate this one, you're going to go back to there. Okay, and the integral exists because when I go to infinity, this thing is 0, and when I get 0, I get minus minus 32 over 4, which is 8. Okay, so on average, the individuals are spending 8 days in recuperation after this uh, treatment for kidney, kidney disorder. Okay, very good. So let's move on. So we're almost finished to the chapter uh, on random variables, and the last thing is this thing called Chebyshev's inequality. Okay, it's a rather famous inequality in probability. There are a lot of inequalities in probability theory, and this is probably the first one that you learn. It's the first one I learned, anyway. Um, and the following is it's the following statement. So if I know the probability distribution of a random variable, uh, I can possibly or potentially compute the expectation of x and variance of x. 
Uh, it's actually not always true because you have an integral and a sum there which may not be available. But let's suppose it, it exists and we know how to do it. But if you give me the mean and variance of a random variable, it's not necessarily the case that I can recover the associated probability distribution. In fact, it's seldom the case unless we can specify that we know that the random variable X is of a given distributional class and that's specified by its mean and variance. Okay, so typically you give me the mean and variance of a random variable. I don't necessarily know its distribution, i.e. its probability mass function or its density function. But the converse is true that if I know the density function, I have a chance of computing its mean and its variance. Okay, so for example, okay, why would you want to? But if you wanted to compute the probability that the difference between a random variable and its mean is lower bounded by a constant, I, I couldn't do that with just in this situation, okay? And it could be important, and we'll explain that in a couple of examples, why you want to compute the term in red, okay? For example, you may want to compute uh, s some sort of confidence interval around a random variable. So what Chebyshev's inequality does is it provides you an upper or lower bound on quantities of this type, which provide you an information about this, even if you can't compute it. Okay, that's exactly what it says. So this is the Russian math mathematician Shebyshev. He gave a very useful slash upper or lower bound, and it's called, unsurprisingly, Shebyshev's inequality. Okay, so back then, in those days, there were not, not that many inequalities, and Shebyshev was uh, good enough to produce one. So let's just, let me tell you what it is. So we take a random variable, capital X, uh, it can be discrete or continuous, okay? And I'm assuming that I know the mean and variance, okay? And that they exist. So the expectation of X is defined to be mu, the variance of X is divided by sigma squared, and I'm supposed to know these numbers, okay? I.e. that they at least exist, okay? So this inequality is useless otherwise. Then, if I take any, so okay, so it's key. So this purple statement is true. Whatever positive number I take, strictly positive, then the probability that the difference between x minus mu in absolute value is bigger than k times sigma is of order at most 1 over k square. Okay, so then again, so again in words, the probability that the value x lies at least k standard deviations from its mean is at most 1 over k squared. Or if you like, you can rearrange this. So the probability of 1 minus this probability is lower bounded by 1 minus 1 over k square. Okay. So, some remarks. k can be any positive number, as I said. It doesn't matter what k is, so long as it's positive. The inequality is true, whatever random variable you have, so long as you have a finite mean and variance, as I said from the beginning. And the theorem gives you a lower bound on the probability that x minus mu is less than or equal to k times sigma. But this bound may not be exactly the probability, it may not even be close, okay? It's nothing more than an inequality. So when you have a statement which is as general as this one, it's no, nothing to say that this is really what the probability is, okay? But it might be close. So here's an example, these are kind of stylized examples, but they illustrate the application of the Chebyshev inequality. So we are told that the number of telephone calls X in a day has mean 14 and standard deviation 3.5. What can I say something about the probability that the number of the phone calls in the day is at most 21 and at least seven? Okay, this is this thing here, this statement I'm saying. Okay, so there's some tricks here, but basically all I'm told is the mean and the variance. I don't know anything about the distribution of it, although of the number of calls, of course, I could hypothesize one, but I suppose that I don't know that. Okay. So now, the probability that x lies between 21 and 7 is the same as, okay, so here, 14 minus 2 times 3.5, and 14 plus 2 times 3.5 looks confusing. But it's not necessarily, because what this thing is, this is 14 minus 2 times 3.5, 2 times 3.5 is 7, 14 minus 7 is 7. 21 is 14 plus 2 times 3.5. Now, why do you have those numbers in here? Well, basically, uh, 3.5 is the standard deviation, and 2 is going to be the k we use in Chebyshev's inequality. Okay, so I have this statement. This one, this one is exchangeable for this one, as I explained. 
Okay, so now what I can do is I can take 14 from both of these. So this probability is the same as that the probability that x minus 14 is at most 2 times 3.5 and at least minus 2 times 3.5. Okay, so these bounds are symmetric, so that's the same as the probability that the absolute value of x minus 14 is at most 2 times 3.5. 14 has a special value because it's the mean of x. Okay, this is kind of a bit of a funny example because it's kind of constructed because we know the mean and variance, so we can construct our bound in this way. And of course, these bounds 7 and 14, if there are something different, some of these tricks are not going to work because these are all to do with 7s. Okay, so I'm now at the probability that x minus 14 in absolute value is at most 2 times 3.5. Okay, so this is the mean, this is the standard deviation, and I'm going to call that k, which is 2. Okay, and now I apply my Chebyshev's inequality, because I know here I have the mean, I have the standard deviation, my k is 2, so that's at most 1 minus 1 over 2 squared, okay, which is 1 minus 1 over 4 is 3 over 4. Okay, so basically the probability that x lies in the interval 20, uh, 721 is at most, at least, sorry, three quarters. So very, very high probability. And it, it seems to make sense, right? Because the average is 13, two times the standard deviation is, is 7. So you think you're pretty likely to lie in that region. Of course, we don't know anything more than that. That's all we know. That's all we can say. Okay, so here now we'll look at an another example, but in this example what happens is that uh, Chebyshev's inequality is not good, in very good. Okay, so this is an example, I know the probability mass function, so I take a random variable x, it could take the value 0, it could take the value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. These are the probability that x takes the value of x, and if you want to compute the expectation, you can show it's 2.64, and that the variance is 2.37. I mean, you can, you know how to do those things at this stage. So the standard deviation is the square root of 2.37, which apparently is 1.54. Okay, very good. Now, by Chebyshev's inequality, we know that the probability that the absolute difference between x and mu is at most 2 sigma is less than 1 over 4. Okay, that's what the Chebyshev's inequality says. Okay, this is the statement here. Uh, this one, I guess. Okay, but in this situation, we can compute our probabilities because we know the probability mass function. So the probability that the absolute difference between x minus mu is at least 2 sigma is the probability that x minus mu is at most minus 2, minus 2 sigma or x minus mu is at least 2 sigma. Okay. All right. So then I take the mu from both of this. So that's the probability that x is upper bounded by mu minus 2 sigma or x is at least mu plus 2 sigma. Okay. But I knew mu. I know mu plus 2 sigma, right? Because I know that mu is 2.64 and sigma is 1.54. So I compute those numbers, and that's minus 0.44, and that's 5.72. Okay, I'm just substituting into the value mu and sigma into the formula. Okay, so that's the probability x is less than or equal to minus 0.44, or x is greater than or equal to 5.72. But we know something about this random variable, it's non-negative, so it can't be less than minus 0.44, and the chance it's bigger than 5.72 is the chance it's 6. Okay, so the probability that this happens is the same as the probability that x is 6 is 0 0.04. Okay, so in this question, or in this example, sorry, this lower upper bound, well, indeed, the probability that x minus mu bigger than 2 sigma is uh, indeed less than a quarter, but in fact is 0 0.04, which is much smaller than the true the upper bound that which has been provided by Chebyshev's inequality so it's too conservative so basically the point or the take home message of the example is Chebyshev in this example provides you an upper bound that upper bound may not be useful in practice in this case it's not that useful because actually it, it's, it's pretty small the chance that this thing happens but of course if you only have the information the mean and the variance and there are examples where you only have that that's the case, then indeed this is the only thing that you have, one of the few things one could use to estimate this probability. It's not the only thing actually. Okay, very good. So that's the end of chapter two. Uh, I'm trying not to go too fast. Hopefully it doesn't feel too fast. You can stop me if you think it is.
So chapter three, so let's have a little look into this chapter, a light uh, introduction into the scenario where we have two dimensional random variables. Okay, we forget about the second bit because we're not gonna get there today. So the two notion of a two dimensional random variable should be clear is we're going to go from the idea that we had one dimensional random variable and uh, that's associated to the distribution or the associated to an experiment and we're gonna take two random variables. And that's nothing more than that. Okay, and indeed you have seen this concept a little bit already. So there is a structure, so we'll forget about the structure, this thing is not going to be important for today. We're just going to talk about this notion of two-dimensional random variables, and if we have time we'll define them in the case of continuous and discrete random variables. Okay, so let us explain from the fundamentals what is the point of what we're discussing. So we have many experiments and situations where you're interested in more than one random quantity. We'll see some examples in a moment. Uh, the first one is this one. So you may be interested in studying the height and weight of a person chosen for a population. So that's an example where you have two random variables. Of course, there is some dependence between those that you would expect. And another example is where you're interested in the hardness and tensile strength of uh, metal or some here this happens to be cold drawn copper but uh, it could be anything I suppose so let's have an example so an example a definition sorry so if we let an experiment be E and S is the sample space I think I said omega earlier sorry I mean S uh, with uh, so the sample space this collection of all possible outcomes of the experiment and now we take two functions X and Y which they assign a real number for every point in the sample space. That is to say, x, you give me a point in the sample space, it give you back a number. y, you give me a point in the sample space, I give you back a number. Those numbers may be, uh, most likely are different for each given s, otherwise the random variables are identical. So then we call the pair of functions a two-dimensional random variable. Okay, and if you like, it can be a random vector. There's no, we're into two, the case we have two things. And uh, we can use vectors. Don't worry, there's not much vectors in this part of the lecture. Okay, so let's continue. So remember that when we defined a random variable in the case where there's one dimension, there was a collection Rx, which is the class of values or the collection of values for which that random variable can take. This is no different in the bivariate case. The bivariate may case means two dimensions. Okay, so that's the set of values little x and little y for which little x is equal to x of s and little y is equal to y of s and s belongs to the sample space. Okay, so that's nothing different. Basically, it's all the n possible values the ca random variable capital X can take and it's all the possible values that r the random variable capital Y can take. It's no different from, it's, it's very minimally different from the case for one random variable. Okay, and it's fairly straightforward. So here we're talking about two dimensions. You can take any dimension. So you can take n dimensions. So you can take a sequence of functions, x1, x2, up to xn for n finite, let's suppose. And they're functions assigning a real number for every outcome in the sample space. Then we call this collection x1 up to xn an n-dimensional random variable or n-dimensional random vector. Okay. This no, once, you've got, once you've gone from 1 to 2, going from 2 to n is not very much different. Okay. It's, of course, things are going to become more difficult to understand, but the notion is very much the same as what we had in the case where there was one dimension. Don't worry, things will not be too difficult. Okay. So let's just look at specialized versions of these random variables. First of all, when you are in the case of discrete random variables. Most of this discussion is in bivariate, two-dimensional cases. So if we take a pair of random variables, capital X and capital Y, and it's a two-dimensional discrete random variable, if the possible values that X and Y take are finite or countably infinite. So basically the point is, instead of having one random variable, it's countably infinite. I have two of them, and they're both countably infinite. And basically what that means is that these random variables are not integer-valued. Okay, if they're integer-valued, they don't need to be, but let's suppose they're integer-valued is the easiest way to think about them. Okay, but it, it, of course you could have fractions just as long as the space is finite or countably infinite. That is to say that the possible values of x and y can be written as a bivariate vector 
of the form x i y j where i is in the set one two three and j is in the set one two three okay and i could be j they could be equal they could be different okay and the other scenario that we consider is where both x and y are continuous that is to say that the two-dimensional uh, random variables x and y uh, are continuous if the range of values of x and y can assume some values in assume all values in some region of the Euclidean pane R2. Okay, if you don't like that, basically these num this one can lie in an interval, this one can lie in an interval, and there are infinitely many values of both of them. Okay, if you don't like this phrase, Euclidean pane R2, but R2 is nothing more than the graph that you've been drawing uh, since you started doing science, right? It's an XY curve. Um, that's it. Okay, let's have a look at two examples. Two examples? Yeah, one example, or two examples. So the first one is the case, this is just an example of a two-dimensional random variable. Don't worry, we're not doing any calculations here. So we consider a television set, and you're going to service it. I don't know why you service television sets these days, but uh, you used to do that, I suppose. So X represents the age to the nearest year of the television set, and Y represents the number of defective components in the set. Okay, so in this situation, we say that x and y is a discrete two-dimensional random variable. And that's because x, which is the age, could be to, it's to the nearest year, so it can conceivably be zero years old, one year old, two year old. I suppose it could go off to infinity, but that's obviously impractical. And y, the number of defective components, that could be none of them are defective, one of them de defective, two are defective, up all the way up to little n, where n is the total number of components in the television set. So, for instance, if I said that x and y realize the value of 5, 3, it means that the television set is 5 years old to the nearest year and has three defective components. And so that's an ex example of defective components. Example of bivariate or two-dimensional random variables. If indeed these things are, are have some intrinsic randomness to them, in fact, I don't think it makes sense because the age is not necessarily random unless you have a massive collection of televisions and you don't know anything about them. Example two. So you have a f fast food restaurant, and you can have drive-in or you can go in and. Uh, walk up to the window. It's a bit strange, almost in the same thing. Um, and so on a given day, it's randomly selected, X is the proportion of time that the random, the drive up facility is in use, i.e. at least one customer is being served, and Y is the proportion of time that the walk up window is in use. Okay, then the sorts, the set of values of x and y are both between 0 and 1, okay? Because basically you could have um, half the time the, the, the uh, walk-in window is available, half the time the drive-in is available, or so on and so forth. So it's a continuous two-dimensional random variable. Okay, so that's example two. Okay, let me see how much we've got left. Okay, so we're going to go up to example one. I think that that's a good thing to do. So I think because we're really, because everybody else who's the, the other two lecture groups uh, are well behind us because they they had uh, some time off because of the vacation period. So I don't want to go too far ahead. So I just have a little look at this notion of joint property density functions. Nice fans, I have read this. If you're wondering if I'm stopping because I haven't read it, I have read it. So as in the one-dimensional random variable case, you can have a number associated the probability or probability density of a two-dimensional random variable takes on a certain value. And so there is exactly that notion. And we start with the notion of a joint probability density function, joint probability mass function for discrete random variables. So we start with the beginning. So we define, we take x and y. They're two-dimensional discrete random variables, and they're defined on a sample space of the experiment. Okay, so this is what we have seen already. It's just a pair of random variables. Now, with each possible value x i y j, we associate the number f of x y. So this x y means this is a joint probability mass function on the random variables x and y, and these are the possible values that the random variables may take. 
And that represents, so again, that represents the probability that x equals xi, y is equal to yj. And it satisfies the following conditions. So for any pair xi, yj in the support, this number is non-negative. And the sum over all possible values of x and y is equal to 1. Okay, sorry. So that is, so this bottom line, what it says is here I sum over the range of possible values of x and y. So x1, x2, x3, y1, y2, y3. So this is a double sum. So that means I take a value of i, I take a value of j, I evaluate it. I take, so for example, I fix i as 1, I sum over all possible values of j. I take i as equal to 2, I sum over all possible values of j. I take i equal 3, I sum over all possible values of j. Okay, that's what this double sum means, in case you are unfamiliar with that notation. This thing, by definition, okay, we have defined it to be this, so that's the substitute here, and that's equal to 1, if I sum over all possible values. Okay, and so that's what the properties of a uh, joint probability mass function or joint probability function for a pair of discrete random variables is. Okay, let's say a little bit more. So the function f of x, y is defined for all pairs of values x, i, y, j in R, x, y, and it's called the joint probability function, or probability mass function. So I like to say mass instead of probability function. I think the phrase probability function is confusing, especially when you take into account you have CDFs and PMFs and PDFs, and it's all very confusing. So I like to say mass function. So that's basically... The, that's basically uh, all possible values in the range you can define you, the function is defined for. Now if I want to compute the probability of any subset of the pair of x and y values, then the probability that the pair of random variables x and y belong to that set A is defined by summing over the joint probability function over all pairs in A. So what that means is the probability that x and y belong to A is the, sum, the double sum, so the coordinate x belongs to A, the coordinate y belongs to A, and I sum over all possible values which lie in that set of f of x, y. That gives me the probability of this thing on the left-hand side. Okay, it's essentially exactly identical to the case where you have two, one random variable, except you've now just got a double sum. So the, the trick is going to be here in discrete random variables, instead of having a single summation, you get two sums. This is no different. Of course, the problem is that double sums are more difficult to work with than single sums, but there's nothing much more to say than that. Okay, so let's finish off uh, today's lecture. I just want to give you one example. Hopefully it clarifies. I mean, we could do both examples, but I think it's uh, we're going too far ahead, so let's just uh, look at one example. So now we define f of x, y is equal to k times x, y. k is a positive number. x lies in the set 1, 2, 3. y lies in the set 1, 2, 3. And I want to find k so that f of x, y is indeed a probability mass function. Okay, so first of all, the range of x, y, well, it's just this set. It's the set x belongs to 1, 2, 3. Y belongs to 1, 2, 3. So there are nine points in this set. Okay. Now, what do I want to do? I want to find K. So what I'm going to do is evaluate, I can evaluate this function for all nine possible values. So for example, F11 one one is 1 times 1 times K. F12 is 1 times 2 times K is 2K. F of 3, 3 is 3 times 3 times k is 9k. So these are all the possible values of this function. And now, I know, of course, k must be positive, otherwise I'm not in a good position to begin with. But also, the sum over all these possible values must be equal to 1. Okay, so that must mean that k plus 2k plus 3k plus 2k plus 4k plus 6k plus 9k plus 6k plus 9k equals 1. Okay, so basically by this equation 3.1, I sum from x is 1 to 3, y is 1 to the 3 of this function, I must get 1, so that's 1 times k plus 2 times k, so this one is f11, this one is f12, this is f13, so you see I fix the first index and I vary the second one. Okay, I fix the second, the first index, I vary over the second one. I fix the third index, I vary over the third one. That's what, sorry, that's what corresponds to this double summation. I 
take x is 1, I sum over all possible values of y. I take x equal 2, I sum over all possible values of y. I take x equal 3, I follow over all possible, sum over all possible values of y. So in the final thing, what I'm garbling on about is you add all these numbers together, you get 36 times k. 36 times k must equal 1, so k must be equal to 1 over 36. So if k is equal to 1 over 36, indeed, this function is a joint probability mass function for the pair of random variables x and y, which are designed on the set 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3. Okay. Okay, this is a long, long one. There's a lot of more examples. Ooh. Okay. So we will see the two examples. I think tomorrow, I think that you all pretty much uh, look um, very happy with what we've done all so far. So, uh, well, that's it for today. today so we will see uh, some more examples on joint probability mass functions tomorrow. Thanks very much for your attention.